Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. Um, uh, it is a great honor and a pleasure to welcome you this evening for this uh, ESG webinar in collaboration with Labory Medical Technologies. Uh, the ESG has fostered a great partnership with the industry who support this great society of ours. And today um, uh, it is going to dedicate itself to uh, lifting solutions for endoscopic resection. We are very proud that we are in its fifth consecutive year um, uh, of, of webinar for education. And uh, we present high quality presentations from all over the world. And this gives us the opportunity to actually um, uh, interact with each other in an informal way. Today, I'm very, very privileged to uh, be accompanied by uh, dear friends and colleagues, um, Dr. Roberta Mazzelli from uh, Humanitas in Milano. Roberta is very well known for her resection work. Um, uh, she has published very widely and is one of the uh, leaders in endoscopic resection in Europe, if not the world. <clears throat> and I would also like to introduce my good friend and colleague, um, uh, Dr. Alberto Marino, who comes from my institution of Rule Free in London. Uh, and he shall be talking about pathological feedback. As you know, um, uh, uh, Dr. Moreno is uh, known for his work on advanced endoscopy, both on resection and also uh, deep enteroscopy, amongst other things. So uh, I think um, uh, without much ado, I shall be asking Roberta to very kindly um, come in and take the microphone. And Roberta will be uh, talking to us both about lifting solutions um, uh, and how they may help us to resect safely, but also um, uh, about uh, the specific role in endoscopic mucosal resection, which is one of the uh, things we perform most commonly in our practice. So Roberta, thank you for coming on. Thank you for joining us. And uh, please tell us all about uh, Everlift and uh, lifting solutions and the MR. Hello, hello to everybody. Thank you, Edward, really for this introduction. I'm very pleased and honored to be tonight here with you. And yes, I will talk about the lifting solutions. So I will try to understand really from the beginning why we need to inject this submucosa and then also how and with using what exactly. So uh, are you able to see my slide? Is everything working? Give me a feedback. Yes. yes, very good. So I want to start just saying that everything we do clinically has an impact and is coming from a need. In this case, talking about endoscopic resection, the need is trying to avoid as much as we can perforation and in general adverse event. And uh, talking about adverse events, one of the main one is the major one is uh, perforation, maybe the most tricky then to and challenging to, to close and to uh, manage. And this is why we are talking about something that is able to help us in having and minimize the risk of perforation. You know that nowadays we also have a classification of perforation. I want to go deeply on this, but the fact is that we are working on the mucosa, on the gut wall that is composed by mucosa, some mucosa and muscular propria. And what we are trying to do is to avoid to touch and to transfer the, our current when we are using it for endoscopic resection very deeply in the muscular propria to, uh, to avoid the, the fact that we are opening. And if we look at the guidelines in how to make the diagnosis and management of perforation, you will see a lot of things and you will learn how to manage this patient. So you will understand that you have different patient, different lesion, different location of the perforation and how to manage and also a different way in trying to close that the fact that you created. But the fact is that before this one, before going in only diagnosis and management, we should go in the pre-resection planning that finally means prevention. So where is prevention? We are trying to prevent and to avoid these adverse events. And this is why we arrived to the concept of injecting the submucosa, because the basic concept is to separate the mucosa layers from the muscularis propria to have a cushion. So to have a in large layer that will reduce the thermal injury and so the risk of perforation and also bleeding, but also improve technical feasibility of our resection technique that we are carrying out and also improve the definition of lesion margin that sometimes is not easy to detect. 
So this is why submucosal injection can impact the risk of perforation. So in the first part of this drawing, you will see a lesion in the gut without any injection. But if you inject properly the submucosa, you will able to see a real um, cushion that you are creating. Otherwise, if you are not injecting properly, even if you are physically injecting something in the submucosa, you won't see any uh, bulging and any cushion. So this is wrong. In the left one, you have the wonderful injection done in the right part is the wrong one. But also when you have a lesion that is carrying and lying on a fold, injection is very important to avoid to grasp the mucosal lay, the, muco the mucosal, pro the muscularis propria with your snare. Uh, so depending also by the location, the injection is helping you in avoiding perforation. And uh, this is not something new. They reported it for the first time, if you see here in 1955, so very long time ago. For sure, they started with what they have, that is normal saline. And uh, most of the time is also what we are using it in our uh, practical endoscopy. Another paper was published in 1973. And from that time, they started to... Um, try different injecting solution, basically for big EMR and ESD, because for big EMR, and when I say bigger, it means more than two centimeter, uh, we know that injection is essential for everything that I said till now, for the ESD is an integral part of the, uh, of the technique. So for very big lesion resectional, uh, submucosal injection is crucial. What we need to inject, for sure, just a needle. So it's very simple. You have different needles so with different lengths and different diameter, but definitely it's just the needle that you need. But then you need to understand what to inject. So you need two things, the solution to be injected and the needle itself. And what is the ideal agent to be injected? Ideally, it should be something not expensive at all, ready to be used, available every time in my unit. Just with the snap, I will take it because it's always there, not toxic for the patient, easy to inject because the more the viscous the solution, the more difficult it is to physically inject it by the syringe. But mainly, and this is why we are talking about this type of solution, should provide a long-lasting submucosal cushion. And uh, they, as I already said, they tried different type of solution from normal saline to fibrinogen and more recently with other commercially available injecting solution. And the more things they are focusing on is the cushion duration, also the price and the availability of the uh, agents that they are trying to inject. I want just to show not so many papers. This is the only one, but I, I thought it was nice because it's a systematic review and meta-analysis, not very old. And they are comparing viscous solution versus not viscous solution, that is normal saline solution, to understand that depending on the size of the lesion, there's any differences in the outcomes of the resection, but also in the adverse events. And if we look with lesion that is two, then more, uh, more than two centimeter, and also for lesion less than three centimeter, there's an increased rate of unblock resection and reduction of residual lesion in the viscous solution group. No differences in adverse events, no significant differences for polyps less than two centimeter. This means that for very big lesion, we should go for a solution that is a long lasting solution and not very disappearing very soon as the normal saline is doing. So coming again to viscous solution, we know that they work better than saline because there's a higher long lasting cushion, but this also means a better delineation of the tissue margin that finally leads to reduce operation time and complication risk. And this is what we are talking about. And they can enable com a more complete and a higher rate of unblock resection. And specifically talking about the evil lift, this is a very novel agent, it's a unique agent. And we're trying to understand with this slide why we used to say that is the solution that we were waiting for and is a unique one. First is that because it's a cellular based uh, solution and also hypertonic. It means that as a slower rate of absorption into the body compared 
to the other. And there's also a wager retaining properties. And also the lifting duration is very long because also two millimeter lift for more than 60 minutes. And this can make the difference. And Alberto will also talk about this in his, uh, in his slides and presentation. And this is why we, we used to call it a super cushion made in by the ever lift. Other, other important point is that as a darker color as compared to the other uh, commercially available uh, lifting agent. And uh, this is why most of the time they make a survey to understand from the Finnish physician point of view, uh, which, is the, which was the preferred uh, lifting solution available to be chosen. They choose the Everlift over the others for this reason. And uh, this will also help us after the resection to understand for any possible adverse events. And uh, the last one from the points that I want to highlight on the other list is the cause effective and safe. The fact is that uh, you have two different uh, syringe that you can choose 5 ml or 10 ml. So it means that you will choose exactly what you need trying to avoid any waste, waste of product, that means waste of money from a cost point of view. And the last point that uh, is not really the last, but uh, because I think it's very important, is easy to manage. It means that you can store it at room temperature, so you don't need to put in the fridge. It will stay there in your unit, really ready, ready to be used and available always. But I want to show you some videos because this all theoretically, I want to show you exactly uh, how it is working in EMR because we were talking about EMR and later on, uh, Edward will talk about ESD because uh, as the title of these um, uh, events uh, is saying uh, the Everlist can be used for both EMR and ESD. We are in the transfer column. We are working in retrofection because this lesion is a little bit complex to be managed uh, in uh, front vision. And uh, the lesion is not so small, it's around 35 millimeter. We are trying to use everything we have in our hand. That means uh, we are placed uh, a, a distal attachment to have more stability. We were working partially in uh, uh, underwater. We are working in uh, retroflexion. And uh, uh, we use the Everlift that simply was just pushed by the syringe to have this nice cushion to stay more stable possible and to have this long lasting cushion during all of our resection because we were planning and we were doing we done a piecemeal resection and this means that we, we inject just once and uh, we were able to have the cushion during the whole resection time and step by step just uh, snaring it we were able to have this nice resectional bed and still the cushion the blue cushion of the ever lift is there i want to show you a second video again is a lower gi lesion 35 millimeter, again, in the transverse column. I don't know why we have all, all this lesion in the transverse column, it was by chance, but sometimes it happens in real life. So let me skip a little bit the diagnostic part because I want to focus in the uh, resectional part. So again, we're trying all the time to use everything we can have. In this case, it's very simple. It's just a needle and you have a lift. So we open it is just ready to be used. Simply just attach it on the series of the needle and then do the prime. So let all the agent be ready at the tip of your needle. So once you inject it, you will be just ready to inject. And as we saw before in the previous video, if you made a nice injection, you will be able to inject just once. And also in this case, we love the underwater. We were working underwater to try to make a very nice and big specimen. And in this way, we did an underwater and block resection. See how the submucosa will remain elevated. I will click go in the last, uh, at the last uh, video, and then I will go the floor to my friend Edward. And this video is coming from his unit, 
is a grazing oozing polyps. So in this case, I, we want to show you this video because uh, you can use Everlift for both upper and lower GI. And this is a great point to say. The other thing is that you know that in the upper GI, mainly we use ESD. So just in some cases in this one, you have indication to do EMR because these polyps, you are not removing them from an oncological point of view, but just because they are bleeding. So it means that EMR is very safe and effective to remove this polyp, but you know, that in the gastric side you have a lot of bleeding because the mucosa is very thick you have a lot of vessels so the more you inject and the more you have a stability of your cushion in the submucosal injection the better to avoid not only perforation but mainly also bleeding and this is why is a great indication for ever lift in this type of procedure so you can see also how it is easy to inject the ever lift in the uh, in the gastric side so also in the upper gi is working wonderfully not only in the lower GI tract. And uh, in this case, Edward is injecting all the Everlift in all the polyps he wants to resect just in one uh, session. And then later on, he will use the snare to resect by and by one all this polyp. And for all the procedural time, the Everlift and the cushion will remain there, stable, ready to uh, avoid, ready to avoid the complication that we are trying to avoid. So is now steering it one by the other without injecting anymore because the cushion is very long lasting one and there's no need to repeat the injection. So I think that I arrived to the point because next type of resection where we can use the Everleaf in a great way is DSD, but DSD is the uh, topic of my friend uh, Edward, so I will stop sharing my uh, screen and I will give the floor to him. Thank you. Roberta, thank you. Thank you so much for that really comprehensive overview of the importance of lifting, especially the properties of this uh, new lifting agent by Laborie Everlift uh, and highlighting it in, in clinical practice. So that was really, really helpful. We will take questions uh, later and we will, of course, discuss. So I think we'll speed through our presentations just to highlight um, uh, the uh, topic in point uh, in clinical practice. So uh, thank you again. So I, I shall be talking about the role of lifting in ESD. Um, endoscopic submucosal dissection we these are my disclosures so and how last year impact, Roberta Alberto yeah, we how, celebrated uh, the 20th anniversary of ESD the quality of life. Professor Yamamoto my mentor our mentor from Jichi Medical University and was the first to publish on ESD he used a scissor type knife and this was 20 years ago so it's been around for a long time but it's getting better and better especially with products such as the one we are discussing today. Uh, we've had a great privilege um, uh, to foster a very good relationship with Professor Yamamoto. We have an exchange program and he's always the special guest star at our um, uh, advanced endoscopy masterclass, Alberto and I's um, advanced endoscopy masterclass, as are you, Roberta. Um, uh, but let's move on to the topic. So I give you this uh, very, very beautiful graphical representation from one of Michael Burke's uh, and uh, Nick Burgess's paper, those great uh, guys from Australia. And this really sums it up. And um, this is a slide I use over and over again, just because of the fact that it sums up the risk of lesions. Um, uh, and basically, the uh, naughty guys here, the bad guys, are the non granular lesions, especially if they're on the left hand side and the rectosigmoid. So if you see something that's non granular, especially if it's in the rectosigmoid area, then it needs to come out unblock, absolutely unblock. And many a time for such lesions, um, ESD is the critical thing. For other things, we may consider EMR. Um, uh, the indication for endoscopic mucosal resection, especially if it's wide field or piecemeal, uh, drops as nodules happen, because if you've got flesh, if you've got a large nodule, then the surface assessment is going to be less accurate. And again, Michael Burke's group have shown that when there is an nodule, the risk of occult malignancy or high grade dysplasia, despite surface patterns saying otherwise, is still relatively high. And of course, the Japanese have also shown this that if you've got a nodule, that's where the cancer will be. And if you've got a central area of depression, especially if it's a non granular lesion, that's where probably the cancer will be. 
And ESD is only indicated for things that uh, have SM1, um, so the first part of the submucosa involvement at the very worst. If, if uh, the lesion is diving deep, such as what we call a JNET3 lesion, this is the Japan expert classification for narrow band imaging, but you can uh, cross-reference it with, for example, BLI. And um, if you see irregularity of the vascular markings, basically that is non-resectable endoscopically. But I hear you tell me, isn't piecemeal EMR faster? Why are you going to uh, lock the unit for a couple of hours just to be doing a lesion on block? Well, yes, um, it is quite fast uh, and it is relatively easier and possibly as Roberta showed, less risky, albeit that's up for discussion, but recurrence rates up to 36%. And yes, um, uh, the Australian group have shown that if you uh, combine um, uh, soft tip, uh, soft, soft uh, coag, snare tip coag coagulation around the borders of the lesion and use avulsion, you can reduce that risk to uh, a manageable one. But not everyone is, is uh, the Sydney group. Not everyone practices at that high level of uh, our great colleagues from Australia. So in the real world, recurrence rates are still very high. Uh, and that is, is a problem. Number one, it is a problem because a recurrent polyp that has recurred on a scar is more difficult to remove. And number two, you are condemning your patient to a very close and tight surveillance interval. And of course, very challenging with fibrosis. And certain types of polyps have even higher uh, recurrence rates at 18 months. Plus, I hear my histopathologist tell me, what did you give me here? a lot of pieces in a pot. What if there's a cancer? What if there's high-grade dysplasia? It's a jigsaw puzzle. And if, if you don't resect with any certainty, especially if there is invasion or early signs of uh, movement into high-grade dysplasia, again, you're in a pickle, especially if you've got a young patient in front of you. Are you going to condemn that patient to a life uh, of surveillance or are you going to offer him or her an operation with all the invasive risks? So anyway, that is why ESD exists. And as I said before, uh, we draw the line as SM1 invasion. You can see that SM1 is no rocket science. It's the first third of the uh, submucosal space. SM2 is the second and SM3 is the third. But uh, we focus on SM1 just because of the fact that the risk of lymph node metastases, a tiny cell going to a lymph node and metastasizing later, is very low for these lesions. So that's why we put the cutoff point at uh, SM1. And I hear the surgeons tell me, but you're going to spend two hours removing that lesion when I can remove it in half an hour laparoscopically. Well, yes, okay, fine. But every colonic surgery, even laparoscopic surgery, is associated with complications, mortality, morbidity, decreased quality of life. Um, uh, apart from the fact that it's much more expensive and it needs a longer time in hospital. Of course, on the other side, you have the risk of lymph node metastases, perforation, or incomplete resection. But that is why we carefully select our patients and we make sure that we're removing the right lesions endoscopically to prevent all these potential complications from operation. And I need to remind you that over 70, the risk goes up. And over 80, colorectal surgery can be associated with up to 29% one-year mortality. No joke. So how? We need to assess it very carefully. We need to understand the language of the polyp. We need to speak to it. We need to speak the language of the polyp and understand it. And it tells us what it's doing by its shape, by its size, by the markings on its surface. Select the correct patient. Not because you've found the polyp, it has to come out. Look at the patient as a whole. Think of the comorbidities and select your cases carefully through a multidisciplinary team meeting uh, where you can involve your surgeons, other endoscopists. It's like a tumor board so that it is shared decision making. And it has been shown that when you have boards, the decisions are more in favor with a good outcome for your patients, even if there is non-intervention. And of course, you need to consent properly. So these are the basics, all right? We've got a million and one tools nowadays. Each Japanese master made their own tool, to be frank with you. I would advise you to stick to one. Choose one. We prefer a, a needle type knife like the uh, flush knife BT or the dual knife, uh, just because we can inject through them. And 
become good at it, okay? So choose one in, in our opinion, and also you need the coagulation, grasp or uh, hemostatic forceps, just in case you have to handle very big vessels, albeit most of our ESDs, uh, the ones Alberto and I do at the all free, we don't even use the coagrasper anymore. Know your diathermy, of course, um, and as I will show you, we prefer the pocket creation method because it really ties in nicely with this presentation about Everlift uh, and keeping that submucosal cushion. So in order to enter that space, we need a hood to help us get into the submucosa. And of course, we need to lift and we need to choose a good agent that has good viscosity, as you heard Roberta tell you, uh, because if you create a very nice cushion, you are opening the gateway for safety. You are keeping yourself away from the muscle. You are giving your um, uh, pathologist a very good submucosa for them to be able to assess for invasion, as Alberto will tell you. And you can also um, uh, relax in the fact that your ESD is going to become more efficient and you can see those vessels better. And it is very important that specific steps during the ESD procedure. Good submucosal lifting is critical, especially at the start of an ESD. Many a time, the perforations at ESD happen either at the beginning or the very end. At the beginning, because it's difficult to get into the submucosal space in the first instance, especially if you are in the lower rectum or you're pushing the scope, okay? So do not push the scope, create that huge lift and keep the scope parallel to the bowel wall in order to make those incisions um, correctly, and the lifting solution that's viscous, such as Everlift, will certainly help you. A round area of fibrosis, so on each side of a fibrotic area or before it, in order to get to the fibrosis under direct vision, and to finalize the resection, as I will show you later. As I said, it maintains the agents of safety, it eases and makes ESD more efficient, and allows visualization of vessels. Combine that to reducing gaseous insufflation. We use liquid, we use saline in our um, uh, resections most of the time, me and Alberto. Um, uh, but if you are going to use gas, suck out the gas. These colleagues from GT Medical University, Professor Yamamoto and uh, Professor Hayashi, are always saying, suck the gas, suck the gas, make it thick. And if you've got a thick agent, if you've got a viscous agent, that's going to work so much better. I come back to what I was saying regarding the type of ESD that we do, we practice the pocket creation method, and that is why it is the course of ESD that we provide at our advanced endoscopy masterclass in London, because this has been shown to be safe, effective, efficient, and universal. And the pocket creation method very much relies on a viscous agent. In fact, Professor Yamamoto was the first person in the world who had patented a viscous agent in that day, hyaluronic acid. But it's been shown that agents such as Everlift have a lot of advantages over that organic substance. So we lift very, very nicely. We make a very tiny incision. The hood allows us to get into that pocket, start creating an undermining of the lesion by creating a pocket. And then it comes to the important bit of opening the pocket, first on the gravity side, then on the anti-gravity side, and then eventually we finish. And as I will show you, things like Everlift are extremely important for the opening of the pocket. Because as I said, you can perforate at, at an ESD most often at the beginning and at the end. The pocket creation method also has advantages because it maintains that lift with that thick submucosal layer because it's not leaking out. And if you make an, an incision that's all the way around, even things like Everlift will leak out. So this works very nicely with this type of solution. So you maintain a thick um, uh, uh, submucosal space with all the advantages. The tip of the endoscope is in the submucosal pocket, so it facilitates tissue traction, and you keep a good direction of the muscularis propria as seen here. So you're just above the muscularis propria, which is a very good place to dissect, both for vessels, both for submucosal fat, because you're below the submucosal fat, and also, it gives you very good visualization of the muscle. And if you can see your enemy, if you can see the muscle, you're less likely to run into problems. And, of course, with a good lift, it maintains your orientation. And the last, most important one, in my opinion, is the fact that if you are inside the lesion, inside the pocket, you 
reduce the artifact of respiratory movement because you become part of the lesion. So several advantages which go hand in hand with a product like Evelift. No wonder Professor Yamamoto used Evelift at our ESD course dedicated to the pocket creation method at the last edition recently in September 2022. And remember this, suck that gas so that you will maximize the lift of your uh, viscous lifting agent. But I'll go back to uh, what I was saying about opening that pocket. Why do we have to be really careful when we're opening this pocket? We have to be careful because the knife can slip. There's not much submucosa left underneath the lesion. And the way you make it safe is by injecting outside the area of resection with something like Everlift that maintains the lift. I call it raising the cliffs of Dover because you're raising the cliffs around the area of resection. And that allows you to cut very nicely around the area of resection, starting on the gravity side first. You cut the mucosa and then you cut the submucosa and then you do the same on the anti-gravity side. And like that, you have a very safe resection without the risk of perforation. And you can resect big things such as this one. This is a very nodular lesion with large nodules. You, can, you know how vascular these things are at the rectosigmoid junction. And this is a resection done in this way. And I'll show you Everlift in practice with a video. So a nightmare scenario. So at the splenic flexure, it was a 2A plus 2C lesion. Uh, it was in the context of ulcerative colitis. It was in the context of a tattoo placed underneath the lesion. So everything was against this lesion. So we really, really used Everlift with great delight because what could have been a nightmare of a procedure became relatively easy. And as you know, um, uh, when you have chronic inflammation uh, in the context of ulcerative colitis, not only do you have the fibrosis, but also you have the submucosal fat, and you can see it there, and that can make it hard. But by lifting underneath the fat, whatever lift, we're able to cut underneath it uh, and reduce the risk of there being a lot of myceles in the water, in the saline rather, and also um, uh, efficient conduction because that fat reduces conduction of the knife and can make a very difficult situation even more difficult. And I can see here that uh, we're showing you the carbon over the muscle. That's the tattoo. So when you are tattooing, please do not tattoo on the lesions. When you are using this, this very good um, uh, uh, prepared solution, Spotex, you should never inject underneath a lesion and just put a tiny blob of saline distal to the lesion. Uh, and even with the lift, you can see that we have good, adequate visualization of the vessels, especially in combination with uh, red dichromic imaging here. I'm coagulating the vessel uh, and going on as such. So uh, this demonstrates how good it is in clinical practice. And uh, just to show you the lift itself, so if you could play this video, so uh, we are injecting underneath a, uh, a difficult lesion. This was... Uh, a Paris O1S um, uh, plus uh, 2A lesion and the uh, uh, transverse colon, a very large lesion. Uh, and we needed all the help we could get. So we chose to lift with Everlift. And I must say that the, uh, the actual result of spreading it away from the muscularis propria, allowing um, a good and tactical dissection was very helpful indeed. And you can see uh, the lift going in, in motion. Another point to mention is um, even when we're using our technique of saline immersion uh, therapeutic endoscopy facilitated pocket creation method, we don't have any problems with Everlift because um, it maintains a slight barrier from the saline. It mixes with it, but it maintains a slight barrier, meaning that, that its viscosity is maintained. It's not going to be diluted by the saline. So you can use Everlift even uh, in the submerged condition. All right, we'll move uh, forward. So um, uh, basically the bottom line, as you probably all knew, but uh, needed a reminder, ESD is very important and useful for unblock R0 resections. It minimizes recurrence rates. Um, it decreases the requirements for surveillance and reduces morbidity um, uh, uh, as an alternative to surgery. Um, uh, but more importantly, and that's why we're going in reverse order, keep those ESDs, especially for pa patients who have high-grade dysplasia, and always have 
your uh, good submucosal lifting agent because that is absolutely mandatory. And Everlift is a very good example of this one. And this is us using it in our unit for that uh, uh, lesion in the splenic plexure. I thank the team, I thank Simon, and I thank Rachel for very kindly supporting us and Louise um, uh, and the good collaboration. And if you want a refresher, this was a WEO um, uh, Standards of Practice Committee webinar that's still available. It's the one with the highest hit um, uh, in, in the world of endoscopy. And I'd like to thank my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Alberto Moreno, who's going to speak next and uh, invite you all to our uh, Advanced Endoscopy Masterclass next year from the 6th to the 8th of September. So without much further ado, I'd like to uh, bring in Alberto. Uh, we'll have the discussion later. So Alberto, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, and uh, I really look forward to your talk about the advantages, the oncological advantages of having a good submucosal lift. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for uh, your uh, nice words. I hope you can hear me. And um, so this is a new role for me. I mean, I'm a, as you know, guys, I'm a gastroenterologist and endoscopist, and today I've been asked to to play the role of uh, the pathologist. And uh, this is uh, this is something new, but uh, we opened for uh, new things. And uh, um, I hope uh, I I hope that uh, I will be able uh, to uh, convey the message here. Um, I've worked on these uh, with our pathologies at the Royal Free, and uh, basically we spoke about this lifting agent solution, how good they are, uh, how helpful they are, and how they make the, um, our life easier. But uh, the, the question here also is, uh, uh, what about the pathology? There is a, an actor that is missing in this discussion, so we want to shine a light on the uh, pathology specimen here. And, um, and therefore, uh, there is a growing body of evidence that uh, showed um, that uh, this uh, lifting agent might have uh, some um, uh, surprising also histologic uh, features. So, um, as you can see here, I reported the most important uh, papers that have been recently published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, and uh, I will use them as a reference during my talk. Uh, so, as you can see here on the slide uh, number A, we have the ORISE gel, uh, which is uh, one of the lifting agents, and you can clearly identify it as an amorphous pale blue-gray material. Uh, which is within the submucosa. Uh, and this is, was done after a resection. If we go um, on the next slide, on the, the, this um, lifting agent may have an area, may appear as an area of uh, condensation or as an area of retraction in the submucosal space. And this depends on how long after these. Uh, uh, specimen are reviewed because we will see that um, with time the submucosal agent might change in terms of uh, feature and appearance at the histological uh, uh, specimen. So deposit resected within a few weeks of injection can appear and change in appearance as we say and uh, they can also resemble other things. Uh, as we can see in this slide here, we have on top, we have uh, a lifting agent solution, which is, uh, um, which initially on the slide eight was uh, suspected for mucin. Mucin is a substance that we um, find many a times uh, in correlation with cancers. So the pathologist here probably was a bit confused. They use uh, some coloration, including PAS, PAS, and uh, it was negative uh, for mucin. And down there here on the bottom slides, on the slides D, you have the real mucin, which is this one. And um, you can see that it's positive when this was uh, uh, where specific coloration like uh, uh, mucicarsin uh, uh, gave the red aspect or the pus gave the uh, purple magenta aspect. So 
uh, with these slides, I'm not saying, and my pathologists confirm that, that uh, using lifting agent can, uh, you know, you can mistake mucin uh, or you can suspect a cancer when you use a lifting agent, uh, really far from that. But what I'm saying is that your pathologist, if he doesn't know that you've used a specific lifting agent, can be a bit surprised, a bit misled. So they will start using a lot of coloration to understand what's going on. And this happened with the uh, previous uh, substances uh, before Everly came out on the market. Um, so if I carry on, uh, and this is also very interesting, uh, we'll see now that this lesion can extend as far as the sub at the subserosa, um, simulating some more and deeper invasion. How do we know that? Because the question would be from the audience. How do you know that if you resect, if you do an ESD or an EMR, you won't be able to see up to the subserosa? And this is a very interesting because in a patient or in several patients with a previous resection, endoscopic resection where the lifting agents were used in the past, um, they then underwent to colectomy or esophagectomy. And this was the result. So here you can see the submucosal layer and the mucosal layer. And here you have this uh, lifting agent. And uh, by time, the lifting agent migrated to the serosa. So it, it doesn't only remain in the colon and the mucosa, but it, it is, these agents were able to find their spaces through the uh, different um, layers of the uh, colonic or esophageal wall. So, and what happened? Uh, happened that uh, as, uh, as, as um, for any foreign sus sus uh, substance in, uh, in our body, there is uh, a, a process, an inflammatory process, which uh, in this case is led by eosinophilic uh, cells, but most importantly by giant cells, which are the one that are circled here and here. While here in the center on the big uh, yellow circle, you have these uh, matrix amorphous substances. So the giant cells, they are trying, which are basically, basically like the cleaner of our bodies. They are trying to remove and uh, bring away these uh, foreign uh, substances. So uh, what is important here is that um, this cause also a long-term process. So to recap about these uh, pre-Everly um, solutions, what we have to say is that what has been documented in the literature is that they persist long after resection. They tend to distribute laterally, but also deeply beyond the histologic extent of the residual tumor. Um, the gro gross impression uh, is, of course, of a more advanced lesion, which sometimes need more uh, assessment if this is not well conveyed to our pathologist. And uh, this causes a, um, a process um, with a foreign body type giant cell reaction. So at times margin difficult, margins can be difficult to be distinguished. Um, we need to be uh, aware also that uh, um, the pathologies may be uh, misled and think that uh, uh, these substances can be amyloid. So they will uh, start using different coloration and at the end they will use a congruent coloration, which will be negative in this case, because it's usually positive for uh, red, the, the true amyloid. And so again and again and again, please inform your pathologist when you use the pre-Everlift uh, solution because uh, this uh, will uh, make his life easier. This will uh, make the procedure less uh, time consuming for this pathologist and also uh, less expensive. Now, Everlift, because um, we want to understand what, uh, what is the effect on Everlift on the specimen, we at the Royal Free Hospital have reviewed some specimen that were removed endoscopically by myself and by Ed, uh, by endoscopic submucosal um, dissection or with uh, endoscopic resection. And uh, I sit down with my pathologist and she told me, oh, there is nothing, everything looks fine but um, we, are, we look at things very deep in details. And, and basically we couldn't find anything, we couldn't find any traces of uh, Everleaf. 
zero not so ever the only two things we found were these where here as you can see here in these little uh, uh, kind of disorientated fibers they are like fragmented collagen fibers and here as you can show is shown by the arrows is an edematous and loose stroma is it caused by the everlift is it not we don't think so but we don't know we don't have a uh, um, an answer, and even if it doesn't, it's not a major alteration of the pathological specimen. It doesn't cause any problem. And uh, here again, we have a second polyp, and again, the only thing we could find is uh, with the arrow was a fragmented collagen fiber. That's all. But so, if you think that we have found this in any specimen, that's wrong because then we look at the third specimen here. And uh, in the submucosal space, that's the detail, there is no um, alteration of the collagen fiber. So maybe it was just coincidental. And here you can see very well these little uh, um, small uh, rounded uh, islands here, white islands. Those are uh, just uh, adipocytes, adip um, adipocytes, which are very well packed. And so the submucosal uh, um, structure is uh, perfectly well maintained. So, is he, is Everlift look uh, looks absolutely fine. It looks like it doesn't damage the sum because it doesn't damage the the the, the specimen, and uh, and therefore we are quite reassured. But uh, we want more um, evidence, and therefore has been there have been preliminary evidence from uh, a large. Uh, um, Court of patients, which were 71, there were who had some resection. Uh, the two largest resections were about 35 millimeters, and the smaller one did not require more than 5 ml syringes. Um, and the result is that no artifacts were seen when the specimen were reviewed by the pathologist. At the moment, and these are my conclusion. Uh, although in the past we saw the lifting agent solution may persist at the injector side, they can dissipate or, um, on the margin, both lateral and deep margins. And we need to communicate this to the pathologist to um, um, avoid you know, some confusion and uh, misleading the pathologist. Uh, Everly at the moment, it, it seems that it doesn't cause any abnormality in the resected specimen. Um, although we, of course, need a future study and more evidence. And uh, I thank you uh, for uh, your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And I pass the uh, uh, mic back to Ed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alberto. That, that was really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, and especially highlighting how we can cause harm without intending to cause harm, you know? by using uh, uh, a special lifting agent that might not be as safe as uh, the one we've just discussed. So uh, it is important to bring it forward. Um, before we sort of have an in-house um, uh, discussion, there are a few questions. So uh, uh, Marianne Noré um, has asked us about adrenaline. Um, uh, and I'm going to pass the, the baton back to uh, Roberta. So. Uh, what are your thoughts about adrenaline, Roberta? Um, uh, we we yeah. covered a lot of lifting agents in your case. Um, uh, let's focus a bit on adrenaline, pros and cons. Yeah, let's say that, uh, and then I want also to know your, your point of view. Yeah. But from my point of view, uh, it's not so essential. I mean that using a lifting agent that is already ready to be used is off-label to add something on in it because some we are um, making different the solution that uh, is made for the uh, lift to lift the submucosa at the same time if we really look at the data about the need for adrenaline in our injection solution we know that adrenaline is not helping us definitely to avoid and to reduce the risk of delayed bleeding and also intraprocedural bleeding a little bit in the intraprocedural but not really in the delayed bleeding 
Uh, so really, if we uh, choose to use a lifting agent as the Everlift because we have a difficult lesion or we are doing an ESD or even with the MR for a very big polyp, uh, I, I would avoid the, the use of adrenaline in this case. Thank you. Alberto, your thoughts about adrenaline? Yeah, I think that nowadays we, we know that adrenaline is not essential anymore. And I will never forget one uh, conference where there was in Norway that it was like, give me blood, give me blood. Because yes, you can see the bleeding point, you can treat them during your, your procedure. And so you might avoid even post-procedural bleeding. So no yes. Question. And and we need to also uh, talk about the elephant in the room. So adrenaline might uh, create a slightly dry feel transiently, but uh, it can cause a lot of discomfort to patients. I mean, the relative ischemia they get, uh, especially if it's injecting in, in the stomach or in certain areas, especially in the rectum, can give rise to significant discomfort to our patients. So. Uh, I think adrenaline is, is falling a bit out of favor to answer uh, Marianne's question. There is another question uh, from my dear friend, uh, Lix Oliveira from Brazil. Hi, Lix. You're always watching us, even from the other side of the world. Uh, thank you. Uh, and he's asking us about the uh, a technical question about the pocket creation method. So which knife would you prefer? Um, Alberto and I prefer to use a needle type knife, such as the flush knife, BT, because it has a bit of grip. And when we don't have it today, for example, I use the dual knife, uh, the J, for example, because we didn't have a flush knife 1.5. But uh, that's our preferred instrument. And to be honest with you, the answer to your question is use what you have, you're most familiar with, but for the pocket creation method, you don't need an insulin tip, uh, insulated tip uh, knife. Um, uh, there's another question. Um, uh, uh, there's courting of controversy here. So uh, a question about the artifacts uh, left by a certain type of agent that you've mentioned, um, uh, the viscous gel. Uh, is, it, is this, Alberto, significant enough to cause a change in practice, you think, uh, away from that? So that's a very good question. And uh, I have to say the truth. The other day I was doing a resection and one of the nurses wanted to give me a lifting agent pre, pre ever lift. And I was like, um, after I read all these things, I was like, mm, no, I, I'll go back. I, I'll use um, something else. So that's, that's what you want to do. And you want to make sure that your specimens are well conserved and they were you know, prepared for, for um, your pathologies. Uh, so I would go for something that is less disruptive as possible. Saying that, you know, if you really want to use something else, as I said before, speak with your pathologist, inform your pathologist, because at the end of the day, if you don't use Everlift, if you, if you don't use the saline as before or the other solution that we make in the house, um, you might have some uh, specimen, specimen abnormalities and, uh, and they need to know. Yes, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. I, I don't think that I would like to inject something that may stay in the body for an indefinite period of time. Um, uh, you saw the, those pathology specimens show that the body reacts, it creates granulomas. In my mind, they can even travel these bits of uh, material, you know, and uh, potentially embolize or lead to septic complications. So I get a bit nervous when there's a a substance that remains. What do you think, uh, Roberta? Yes, exactly. Because then, you know, we were also talking about how to inject. If you made a wrong injection because there, for example, fibrosis, uh, because there's a no lifting sign or because you are not so skilled in injecting, because it can be the case, there's also a learning curve for injection. You could inject directly in the peritoneum or let's say, generically outside from the subserosa. And what will happen there if there is a substance that will remain for we don't know how much time and we don't know exactly the reaction. So I should put a warning on this, honestly. I think so. I think so. There's another lovely question here, um, uh, which uh, bridges the uh, two sides of Labori, the blue and the black, the... Uh, Everlift and uh, the, the Spotex. So uh, 
Would you therefore advise against tattooing a polyp prior to propose the MRASD, considering that the tattoo may cause submucosal fibrosis, making subsequent lifting difficult for EMR? I'm going to take that question. So um, uh, I'm a paladin for tattoos, uh, although it is still a controversial subject. Some people uh, argue against it, but I think the, the, the majority of the GI community as endoscopists, even with the ESG guidelines and the ASG guidelines, tattoo is a good idea. But you have to do it properly. You have to do it properly. And properly means never tattoo underneath the lesion, never, because you're going to create a nightmare, both for recurrence on the scar, for resection, et cetera, et cetera. You need to put a saline bleb because as uh, Roberto was saying, once a needle goes through the wall, you're never really sure whether you're going to hit the space immediately, the submucosal space. And if you're unlucky, you spray everywhere black, all right, and make a laparoscopy a nightmare, apart from the reactions. Tattoos can cause reactions. And number three, um, uh, in order to reduce the risk of the polyp tattoo spreading underneath the polyp itself, go distal. Choose at least three centimeters distant on the contralateral wall and don't put in too much saline. Just find the space and then swap. Because if you put in too much saline, you're going to cause that tattoo to drift into that cushion and travel. Do you agree with me, guys? Do you have anything to add to all that? Yeah, just one thing, if I can, that also from an oncological point of view, if that lesion is not to be endoscopically resected, but for a surgeon, there's really no, no reason to tattooing under the lesion because that one will be uh, an alert, a red flag for the, for the surgeon saying, hey, here the margin is free. You can cut here where the tattoo is. If you put on the lesion, doesn't just means uh, here there is a lesion. But if you are not so good in sizing the lesion, the surgeon won't know exactly where the free margin is. So there's no really no reason to put the, the, the tattooing under the lesion. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, can I, can I add something which might my, my appear very stupid, but I, we are seeing something on our daily practice, which is sometimes exceptional. Don't tattoo the sequel, please. Don't tattoo the sequel. And also the rectum, please. Because we see this sometimes. There is no point. Yeah, there's no need. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Roberta, I think there are some other um, uh, questions directly uh, to you. So uh, um, uh, why not use normal saline? You've already answered this. But tell <laughs> yeah. us again. It's about... This is about um, uh, lifting solution, you know, and the same person, Yogesh, hi Yogesh, um, uh, asked also about the gel of using and starch. So just give us a brief summary to recap what brief you said. Summary? Yeah, because uh, this type of different solution than saline, they're long lasting. So your cushion will uh, let you avoid the adverse events, mainly perforation. So the more you are stable with your cushion, the more you are safe and not only safe, but also effective with a re higher rate of in block resection. And this is why viscous solution are much better than normal saline but you can also use normal saline if you only have that one. But if you have something really, really available in your unit with uh, you can storage room temperature really there to use, very easy to inject, you will save in the long-term time and money. Amazing. Very succinct and very accurate. Um, uh, my camera just popped over. So I was, I was, I was just telling you um, uh, about about uh, the uh, the injection uh, solution Everlift vis-a-vis -vis others. You mentioned something very important in your presentation when you were covering the topic. Um, it's the only one that's available in five and ten, isn't it? Yeah. So you can actually pick. Um, uh, the amount of solution you need um, uh, according to the size of lesion. And that creates cost effectiveness because yeah. as you know, when solutions are created generically, you have a whole bag, which many a time is wasted uh, or uh, you open a couple of syringes which are wasted. So I think having the right amount is, is, is useful. Do you find that in your clinical practice as well? Yeah, definitely. So you can choose the amount you need and you can open just the syringe needed. I show also in the video no, how it is easy. The package is so friendly. You just open it and the syringe is there. And if you are doing an ESD, maybe 
for, you will use a 5 ml, but or 10 ml, sorry. Otherwise, you will come, for example, a 5 ml for DMR very easily. Thank you. Alberto, I'm going to ask you a question myself now. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So lifting solutions, um, Everlift in this case, uh, it's been shown to be so good. Um, your take, your personal take, because there's not much evidence there. I don't think a, a proper study has been done. You know my preference. Um, uh, but your preference towards resecting um, uh, uh, lesions cold, unblock cold uh, EMR um, uh, or cold snare. Do you actually uh, prefer to pop uh, a bleb of something, Everlet, for example, and if so, why? Yeah, I think we we've, we've discussed this uh, many times behind the scene, and uh, we 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 adopted the same practice, and we prefer to to inject something underneath the the polyp this or the the diminutive polyp because this will give us uh, more. You know, the specimen will uh, will include more tissue, so it will make the life of our pathologist easier. We can see the edge of the lesion better. And uh, although Cosner with or without lifting is very safe, but uh, these are an, an extra layer of accuracy to our technique. Absolutely. We are in total agreement as always. Okay, um, uh, I'm going to uh, take another question from Lix from Brazil. So most of endoscopists in Brazil use volvuven um, uh, with methylene blue. What do you think about it? I think this is a question for uh, Roberta, the, uh, uh, the, the expert of lifting agents. So you know that you, you said before one concept Ed, about the knife that the, the best is what you are familiar with. So if they are familiar with Volven, for example, on every use, so I can't say anything in uh, console pros, I don't, I don't know, honestly, I read a lot of data about it, but it's not part of the very viscous solution. So for sure, the cushion that is providing is uh, more and uh, more stable than normal saline, but for sure it's not the cushion that is provided by Everlift uh, as lifting agent. So it depends on what you want. If you want something more stable than saline, Volivan is okay. But if you want something even more stable than Volivan, then you, you should go for a different lifting agent as they have a lift. Yeah, it is designed to stay there. Eh? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I will take the, uh, the final question. I think this is a question from Italy, potentially, uh, from uh, Dr. Conti. So, um, and again, I'm going to ask you this question, Roberta, just because you mentioned it briefly, you combine the technique, um, yeah. we combine it with ESD, but there was a question relating to why would you inject if you're going to use underwater? Yeah, I know, I know. We will love in our unit to combine things. And I will, I, I really also want to add this comment uh, on the cold uh, adding, uh, the cold snaring EMR and injecting before, because we are doing this for every now single um, duodenal polyps. You know that in removing duodenal polyps, you can have the higher rates of perforation because the wall is very thin. So is where really you need the injection solution that stays stable for a very long time. And nowadays with the, the flat one, not the SSI, because it's difficult to cut with a cold snare, but the, the flat and 2A or 2B lesion, we usually use the cold, so injecting solution plus, um, uh, plus cold, but let me say to answer to this question, plus underwater, because underwater will help you in having a bigger specimen with the same snaring size. Uh, because by floating the lesion, you will be able to grasp it a bigger pieces, definitely. So the injection is helping you in avoiding complication and you are not interfering with the underwater with the injection solution, but the floating will help you in having bigger specimens. Yes, so they are not mutually exclusive because people have this misconception. Oh, you inject, you can't float. You float, you can't inject. They're not mutually exclusive. They work in synchrony. Yeah. So that is the answer to your question. Guys, um, uh, although uh, we elected to extend it somewhat because we started a bit uh, later um, for technical reasons, um, I think people would like to go and have the dinner now or uh, something else. Um, uh, so... 
Uh, I wish you thank to thank you so much for uh, participating and helping me um, uh, show and demonstrate the importance of lifting agents, especially this uh, novel lifting agent, which is specially designed to have a long lift uh, to make uh, um, uh, resections, endoscopic mucosal resection and endoscopic submucosal resection safer and more effect efficient and effective. Um, uh, so thank you, Roberta. And uh, thank you, Alberto. I also wish to thank um, uh, the, uh, the organizers um, uh, and the sponsors of this uh, webinar, um, uh, Labori, okay, uh, who are, uh, who always listen and work very well with us endoscopists and are constantly uh, changing practice to help our lives even more. Of course, I uh, wish you to come to ESG Days, the flagship um, conference of our great society. Um, as you know, it's going to be held in Dublin uh, on the uh, 20th of April to the 22nd of April next year. So round the corner and the abstract deadline for that is the 6th of December. So even more round the corner, submit your abstracts. Let's have more fun. Um, join our society. It's a growing um, uh, society with uh, success and strength from strength to strength. Uh, we have surpassed um, uh, many other congresses in the size of our ESG days. We continue to evolve. We continue to bring the best practice to the front line of our patients. So uh, please join and support our society. And of course, uh, don't forget that uh, there are research grants. Um, uh, our society reinvests in academia and uh, we, we have created these research grants in order for uh, young scientists and uh, good collaborators to actually continue to progress. So it's fast approaching, end of the month. Don't miss your opportunity. Um, uh, and of course, our next webinar um, uh, will be chaired by uh, my good friends, um, uh, Peter and Helmut, uh, Helmut Messman and Peter Zizerma. Uh, with uh, uh, a good um, panel uh, made up of other friends, uh, Manuele Rondonotti, uh, Yuchi Mori, uh, Michael Bretta, and uh, Rodrigo. And it's going to be um, uh, focusing on the papers of the month, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, interesting controversy as well as uh, new pearls of wisdom coming out. So I wouldn't miss this one at all. Um, uh, thank you so much for to everyone again. Thank you to Labori Medical Technologies, the ESG Governing Board, the webinar team, David Inker and uh, Gabi Varga from uh, you know the ESG Secretariat who always support us and uh, uh, hold that uh, flame of direction so proudly and highly. Uh, and have a good evening, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.